Hello, and welcome to the 2021 Lancaster High School Virtual STEM Expo. We're very pleased that you've been able to take the time to join us this evening. Over the next several minutes, you're going to be hearing from students in both our engineering and biomedical science pathways as they describe the research and projects that they've been working hard on for the past several months. On behalf of the faculty and administration of Lancaster High School, I can say that we are all very proud of these students. And I think as you watch this evening, you'll see that the future for the city of Lancaster is indeed very bright. Before we get to hearing about each student's individual project, we would like to take a few moments in honor our graduating seniors. These young men and women have dedicated the past four years to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And they have completed either our biomedical science or engineering pathway. And several have taken courses within both pathways. So without further ado, here's to the graduating class of 2021. The Lancaster High School Project Lead the Way STEM Seniors for the class of 2021. Kaylee Anderson. Kaylee completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Ohio University where she will major in nursing. Christian Berge. Christian completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending The Ohio State University where he will major in aerospace and aeronautical engineering. Julianne Callahan. Julianne completed the biomedical science pathway and upon graduation she plans to pursue her passion in the arts, acting, and modeling. Sarah Kraft. Sarah completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Bowling Green State University where she will major in communication sciences and disorders. Chandler Donahue. Chandler completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending Oregon State University where he will major in electrical and computer engineering with a minor in computer science. Nicholas Grayson. Nicholas completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall he will be attending West Virginia University where he will major in biological sciences. Jocelyn Jewell. Josie completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending the University of Rio Grande where she will major in nursing. Eric Johnson. Eric completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall he will be attending The Ohio State University where he will pursue a major in the health sciences. Osland Catter Henrik. Osland completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Ohio Wesleyan University where she will major in pre-med. Lauren Kunzler. Lauren completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Ohio Wesleyan University where she will major in biochemistry and pre-med. Roberto Martinez. Roberto completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall he will be attending Johns Hopkins University where he will major in neuroscience and minor in chemistry. Chase Miller. Chase completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending The Ohio State University 
where he will pursue a major in mathematics and a minor in computer science. Kendall O'Neill Kendall completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending The Ohio State University where she will major in nursing on a pre-med track. Grace Parrott Grace completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Slippery Rock University where she will major in exercise science. Thomas Richardson Thomas completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending Vanderbilt University where he will major in economics with a minor in political science. Keaton Phillips Keaton completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall he will be attending Columbus State Community College where he will major in dental hygiene. Luke Seymour Luke completed the engineering pathway and upon graduation Luke plans to join the US Air Force through the Air National Guard. Skyler Stevens Skyler completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending The Ohio State University where he will major in computer science engineering. Janessa Wright Janessa completed the biomedical science pathway and in the fall she will be attending Capital University where she will major in biochemistry and pre-med. Eli Young Eli completed the engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending the Georgia Institute of Technology where he will major in aerospace engineering with a minor in physics. Noah Johnson Noah completed our engineering pathway and in the fall he will be attending Slippery Rock University where he will be majoring in business. Jacob Hutzler Jacob completed our engineering pathway and after graduation he will be joining the United States Navy and entering into the Navy's nuclear engineering program. Madeline Davis Madeline completed our engineering pathway and in the fall she will be attending The Ohio State University where she will major in business marketing. Jacob Reed Jacob completed our engineering pathway and in the fall will be attending Ohio Northern University where he will be majoring in engineering. Olivia Maynard Olivia completed our engineering pathway and in the fall she will attend The Ohio State University where she will major in computer science engineering. We want to congratulate all members of the Lancaster High School STEM Class of 2021. Hey everyone, I'm Mr. Hartzler and I teach Intro Engineering Design, or IED, and Principles of Engineering, or POE. And we have six total engineering classes here at the high school. Two of them are semester level classes. We have an intro to programming and uh, programming essentials. And then we have, uh, typically they would then go into the either computer science, if you want to just maintain that little pathway and kind of be done. Or you would hop into my class and take intro engineering design, then principles of engineering, then you can move on to civil engineering and architecture or CEA. 
There's all kinds of combinations of all of these classes, but the main part is that you take some engineering classes. They're good for you. They help you to create. Uh, think creatively and they helped you to design stuff and come on now it's nice to just be in school and build things so come on down to us and check it out but you should also check out what we do right that's what we're doing here with the stem expo we're trying to present it to you and though this year it's virtual still exciting folks you got to check it out we have a website for it too and uh, it's going to be popping up on the screen somewhere over here i'm not doing that editing but it's going to be great check it out there's youtube videos and there's links and there's all kinds of sweet posters you really got to check it out read the descriptions though read what these kids intended on doing and then check out the video and see what they did it's awesome highly recommend it i uh, i really love all the projects so many of them did so well and even biomed you know engineering and biomed we tend to kind of fight sometimes but in the end we're all building stuff we're all creating things uh sometimes it's posters sometimes it's builds but either way people are learning and it is an exciting place to be so check out that stem expo website and again it's going to be posted around here and it's uh it's it's bit.ly forward slash stem expo 2021 check it out people it's amazing have a great day everybody and again check it out and now, our feature presentation. My name is Jordan Gardner, and my project was to determine whether a student's ability to read music affected their overall reading speed in literature. Um, so, to find my results, I sent out a survey with questions like, can you read sheet music? If you can, how well can you read it? Um, can, what, how often do you read? And I asked them to take a short reading speed test so that way I could determine their reading speed. Um, so my results found that um, the ability to read music had no effect whatsoever on reading speed for literature. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mallory. Um, this is my research project. So my hypothesis was that students who regularly consume coffee and other caffeinated beverages will perform worse in school and have lower grade point averages than students who do not re regular, regularly consume these drinks. Um, I chose to research this to find out whether or not daily ca coffee consumption affects grade point average. Um, and I got my data by sending out a survey to 52 high school students and the results of the survey showed that um, coffee and um, caffeinated beverages on a daily basis does not significantly uh, affect students' performance in school. Our idea was that we needed a building in Lancaster, something that people needed. So for our idea, were clothes, phones, and gas. But, however, we chose clothes as our dominant option because clothes are necessary for the people in Lancaster. However, they also need phones and gas, but we figured that phones uh, can be, in some ways, an accessory, and gas is something that not everyone has, especially for anyone that doesn't have transportation or it takes alternate meanings of transportation. And clothes, so we decided clothes are what people needed the most. So now I'm going to talk about our like design idea process and how we like, came up with like the central design of the building. So we started with this small diagram here and we really just want our basic ideas of like where the areas of the building would be and like how we had a parking lot set up because we knew we needed the parking lot as a big part of it. Um, so we moved on from that and we made a more, much more in-depth idea. Once we found out where exactly our site would be, we got the, where we stand out, we figured out where this would be. And then we started with the actual construction of the building and we wanted the loading area coming in. We got all that and then we started putting in the actual rooms and stuff. And then we got like more specific with measurements and such and we had to figure out like all of that. So we got like regulation, parking sizes, and stuff like that stuff. All right. So once we finished figuring out like what, what we were gonna do and where we went, kind of wanted everything, uh, we want to go ahead and, and jumped into the code. So in terms, so there was a lot that we had to go through. But in terms of some, of some of the biggest things, we had zoning, which was a commercial general, which worked really well for us because our building is a commercial. And then we also had a uh, construction type, which we were gonna do a construction type three as the least restrictions without breaking any sort of code. 
Uh, in terms of some other things here, use and occupancy classifications, we are mercantile, given as we are a clothing store, so that's going to be group M. Uh, egress, we had a maximum of 49 occupants per exit. So that's, you know, kind of very regulates how many exits we need. Uh, we're looking at about 360 total occupants at any given moment in the building because it is a single floor. So that was nice. Don't have to worry about a basement or a second story. Uh, and then in terms of parking, uh, this just g generic commercial parking. So one out of every 25 spaces needs to be handicap accessible. And then one of every six handicap accessibles needs to be van accessible. Um, once we got all of the code figured out, kind of figured out what we need, how many exits, what kind of parking we need, then we went ahead and threw everything into Revit. All right, moving into our Revit section of our video. This is a site that was made by John. As Jacob discussed, we were able to keep land for our parking lot while also leaving a nice space for our building to sit, as well as our rear idea for a pool around uh, donation area. And then for the building itself, this was our general layout that still managed to follow our original plans with the restrooms and cash registers near the front, all of the products in the middle, and a warehouse following in the rear. And then with a 3D view, you can see the store came together relatively nicely. We filled the space quite well for our purposes, and overall managed to match our original ideas very well. I'm Eve Harrison, and my research project was organized to show how exposure to COVID-19 relates to interest in sports and academics. My, hypos <laughs> my okay. hypothesis was if a student has been exposed to COVID-19 diagnosis or secondhand exposure, they will become less invested in school and sports. Um, I had a survey that was given to 60 students at random of six questions, and a correlation was found that the relationship between COVID-19 and student participation in school decrease because about 57% of students showed a decreased interest, which helps prove my uh, research because it supports the idea that if a student has been diagnosed, then their participation will decrease. My name is Maddie, and my research project is over finding if there's a correlation between screen time and how much sleep you get each night. My hypothesis for this research project was that teenagers will have increased screen time with less sleep and the opposite for adults. The way I found my results is I conducted a survey to 80 people, ranging in ages from 14 to 74, asking the questions how old they were, how much screen time they had, and how much sleep they got each night. These results ended up proving my hypothesis that there is a relationship between screen time and how much sleep people get each night. Hi, my name is Jonah Hoffman Weizmann, and this is my research project. Now, I grew up playing a lot of wheat tennis. It was always a fun pastime and even a nice way to get a little bit of exercise. But even when I was little, I always wondered how Wii Tennis's quality of exercise compared to that of real tennis. That's what my study aimed to answer. For my experiment, I took my classmates' resting heart rate, took their heart rate again after five minutes of Wii Tennis, then on another day, took their heart rate again after five minutes of real tennis. The results showed an average increase of heart rate of approximately 40% for Wii tennis and about 63% for real tennis. While real tennis clearly elevated heart rate more than Wii tennis, Wii tennis's results are nothing to scoff at. The data showed a clear and consistent elevation of heart rate and proved itself to be at least a decent form of moderate exercise. But the data also showed that real tennis still reigns supreme. So maybe don't cancel your gym membership to buy a Wii just quite yet. Hi, I'm Riley, and for my project I made an, a remote control boat. And on the back, I placed a propeller that would move it forward and backward and programmed it to my cortex and then I also added a rudder that goes into the servo and that is also programmed into the cortex. I had to add pontoons which are water bottles to the sides in order for it to um, be able to stay above the water and let's test it out.
I'm Sarah Kraft, and this is my research project on the connection between speech disorders and learning disabilities. Um, to start with my abstract, I had an interest in speech disorders to begin with, and I wanted to see if there was some neurological connection to um, like the presence of a speech disorder and a learning disability later on when the child entered elementary school. So my objective was to find if a learning disability will be present um, in a child with some type of speech disorder or if the topics are independent and have no correlation. So I started by getting background information on types of speech disorders, um, where the speech disorder affects the brain and um, how it like begins and what some symptoms are. And then I also gathered background information on learning disabilities and again, what areas of the brain are affected and mainly what ages they start to kick in. And then I um, connected the two into sites that had studies done from speech disorders and learning disabilities. Um, since I was not experimenting in this project, it was only research and I used sources that had this specific experiment already done so that I could use their research and not, I didn't do my own. Well, like I didn't do an experiment. Um, the results were that if a child was a late talker or somebody who had speech development issues, they had some um, academic delays when entering kindergarten. One specific source followed children from the ages of two to six and watched their progression. And although a child may have outgrown a speech disorder, they showed academic delays and they were not ready for like the learning style of a, a normal school. And there was also another source that stated that um, speech disorders are kind of like the first key indicator of a possible learning disability in the future. So that was, I concluded that they are connected in some way and that it's kind of different from every child and just like what type of speech disorder they have. But um, most children were not as prepared as other children who had good speech and fully developed. Thank you. Hi, my name is Annabelle Farmer, and my presentation was about male versus female self-confidence and self-perception. Um, this is pretty much about how high school students see themselves and the self-confidence they have due to social media and athletics and their friend group and stuff like that. And my hypothesis was that females would have a lower rate of self-confidence than males, and as kind of a subcategory non-athletes would have a lower self-confidence than athletes. Um, I chose to do this because, in my opinion, there's been a lot of lowering of self-confidence due to social media as time's gone on, so like your parents might not have dealt with this, but if you're a high schooler in today's age, you probably have. Um, I sent this out on a Google form, and I posted it to social media, and I walked around during classes to have people I knew take this. Um, through the results, up here are the males, there's a lot more athletes that I answered than non-athletes. And I asked them the majority of questions like rating their self-confidence and happiness. And one was the highest and five was the lowest of like self-confidence. So as you can see, most, most males are in the middle area. And most females, again, a little bit higher in the middle area, so that kind of disproved my hypothesis in the fact that I thought females would be lower, but it was actually males. And most of the answers I asked them to elaborate, and they said that social media and peer pressure was a really big factor into why they were not doing good. And that's pretty much it. Hi, I'm Tyler Rager. This is my project. I created a simple generator. Basically, you spin this. It's a chain and sprocket system connected to a motor on the back. The spinning the chain and sprocket creates voltage that is sent to the circuit, which lights the LEDs. Let's see how it works. <laughs> now, I did manage to light up, I think, 20 LEDs all at once. It depends on how fast you decide to spin it. Um, I had to add this 
create tension in the chain because if I didn't, the chain would pop off the back and it creates issues, obviously. But uh, there's my project. Hello, my name is Andrew Rader, and this is my STEM project. So with the loss of crowds over the pandemic, I wanted to see how the absence of those crowds affected the athletes on the field regarding blood pressure and decision making. So my study consisted of a cup stacking game where the athletes had to build a 4-3-2-1 pyramid with cups and two trials. One was timed and one, the other was timed as well but had a crowd. And I wanted to see how the blood pressure and decision making was affected by the crowd and people shouting around them as they built this pyramid. So my study found that 66% of athletes blood pressure actually dropped during the crowd screaming at them as well as their decision making slash time, re time recorded. 54% saw a better time when the crowd was yelling at them than when they weren't. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lauren Kinsler and then I did my presentation on how do heart rates compare during exercise between females and males. So my overall objective was to compare the heart rates between males and females and how they differ during exercise. So I, this experiment was a field study and this was done by taking participants with the same running capabilities. So I first looked at the research of the Journal of Clinical Diagnostic Research Entry and basically what it said was it states that the heart rate during exercise compared with females and males will be at a faster rate of a trained female versus a trained male and an untrained male. This is due to the body being conditioned for the activity versus not. The average rate for females will be higher. Females have smaller hearts than males naturally. The activity of exercise will increase the heart rate, but once that's max, it will plateau. So my methods and materials, um, my materials were an Apple watch or, or just a regular watch that records heart rate. Um, I also went down to the track and I got the participants of the boys and girls track team. I also use the notes app on the iPhone to collect um, their phone numbers and I then texted them after the track practice to get the results. I used iMessage to contact them. Um, I used Google Docs to put the phone numbers and all the um, results onto it so it could easily be put into my graphs here. So I first went down to the track to ensure equal distance and then I also got the boys and girls track team. Um, all the participants had an Apple Watch or some other type of watch to record their heart rate to be about the same. The testing groups for both females and males were six or more individuals. After the practice, the participants were messaged with the phone numbers received before the track practice. So after that, I got the results here and put them in two different graphs. The top line right here is the maximum for the females and the bottom darkish red color is the average. Up there, the light blue is the maximum and the dark blue is the average. Um, if this was down here, it'd be easier to tell, but not enough room. But as you can see, the males maximum were significantly larger. So for my discussion, it was a quantitative data, which means I did the research myself. So the trend shows the females is like 140 to 150 beats per minute for the average, and for the maximum, it was 160, 170 beats per minute. And then the males were significantly larger. So overall, um, that refutes my hypothesis that the females' heart rates would be larger because the average adult male heart rate is between 70 to 72 beats per minute on average, and the adult women is larger. So overall, the data collected refutes the hypothesis, and the scientific data and research um, supports it. My name is Adam Kreiser. I did my research project on the difference between VO2 max and male and female high school distance runners. Uh, my hypothesis was that there would be about a 10% difference in between them. Uh, I chose to research this because I, I run, so I just thought it'd be something fun to do. Um, I got my data from, I had all of the runners that took part wear a Garmin watch while they ran, and it makes an estimate of their VO2 max based on their heart rate when going certain speeds. Uh, VO2 max is pretty much a measure of how efficiently your body can process oxygen. Uh, I found that my, there was a 
0.5% difference in between them, and uh, this shows all the female measures, this shows all the male measures, this is male and female combined, and then these are the averages. Hi, my name's Isaac. Um, my project here is modeled after a baseball pitching machine. So basically the idea is that you put this ball and you feed it through the wheels and it launches it out the other side. Um, it uses these gears. Basically the motor spins the big one at the back, which turns the little one fast. And uh, it all ends up creating a really fast spin in these two. Uh, okay, and then Back here, these switches uh, all correlate to different speeds. So this one spins it slow, a little faster, and then the fastest. And then uh, I can demonstrate. So this is the slowest speed. This is the middle speed. And this is the fastest. And the ball in. it. Alright, so my project was on how Wim Hof's breathing technique affects heart rate. Um, so my hypothesis was that heart rate would be lowered. Um, to, so Wim Hof's breathing technique is consists of 30 to 40 deep breaths, um, then exhaling and holding your breath for as long as possible. And then when inhalation is needed, uh, breathe in and hold your breath for an additional 10 seconds. And after that, have the patient relax and record their heart rate. Um, their heart rate was lowered by an average of 5 beats per minute, uh, proving my hypothesis correct. My name is Sky Hotel and my project is how does adolescent knowledge about healthcare and access to it affect future decision making in healthcare. I did a survey of 70 people, 50 adults over 18 and 20 um, adolescents under 18, and I compared what ad adults knew as adolescents and if they believe they are able to currently make informed healthcare decisions and if adolescents believe they know enough currently to make future healthcare decisions that are informed. My hypothesis was that if you had more access to healthcare and knew more about it, then you would be able to make more informed decisions as an adult. When looking at my study, um, there was no correlation in, adult knowledge, in adults as when comparing their knowledge as adolescents to being able to make future decisions, with 64% knowing less than an average amount about healthcare, but 86% still believing they could be informed about healthcare. Adults who also also believe that even if they didn't have access to healthcare, they were still able to make informed decisions. With 20% had no access to healthcare when they needed it, but 86% still believe they could make informed decisions despite that. In adolescents, 60% um, of students knew less than average about healthcare, but 95% believed that they needed to know more about healthcare to help them make more informed decisions, which shows how much more knowledge that adolescents would like to help them make more informed decisions. So, but despite knowing less, 100% of them still said they would get health insurance as an adult. Um, no correlation could be found in not having access to health care and making informed decisions, with 5% not having access to health care and 40%, 45% still making informed hoping they can make informed decisions as an adult. So my hypothesis was somewhat correct because nobody really knew that much about healthcare and believed that they could make informed decisions, but people who knew less did believe they did, couldn't make as informed decisions as if they would know more. My name is Grace Parrott and I did my research on the effectiveness of surgical and non-surgical treatment of tarsal coalitions. Um, a tarsal coalition is the abnormal bridging between bones and a foot, which are also known as tarsals, and it typically causes hind foot pain, stiffness, limited range of motion, and it usually starts in late childhood and early, early adolescence. Treatment can be non-surgical or surgical depending on the severity and the patient's age. And the surgical options include resection, where the coalition is removed, and fusion, where the bones affected are completely fused together. And then the non-surgical options are orthotics, which are like assistive devices to help aid the pain so that patients can carry on normal day-to-day -day activities. And then the other non-surgical option is immobilization, which can be like a walking boot or a non-weight-bearing cast. So in order to determine which treatment works best for tarsal coalitions, previous research posted on the internet was uh, used. So I didn't do any studies, I just used information online. And these include a study of non-operative treatment by Eric Shirley and research done by Michael S. Downey about the various treatments of tarsal coalitions. 
and data was also used for research presented by Kaiser Permanent and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. Um, research provided by each of these resources was then compared to determine which treatment was most effective. So the results of the non-surgical um, treatment, many doctors recommend that this treatment is attempted first because it's more, it's um, before a more invasive treatment is taken. And an orthotic is one of the options. It's an artificial support or brace for the body that can limit joint motion and ease the pain. Some of these can be like a medial heel wedge, a Thomas heel, and a medial longitudinal support, which is basically just like an arch support. These are usually inexpensive compared to surgery, so this is also why it's a good option. And though they work well for some, they don't work well for others. So it's kind of a trial error process, so it can take a lot of time. Immobilization is another type of treatment, and it involves zero movement of the foot and ankle joints. This can be done with a cast or walking boot, which both of these work by keeping the foot in like a neutral position. So it takes the stress off of the symptomatic joints. This treatment is usually over a pretty great span of time though, usually three to six weeks. So this can kind of weaken the foot and the muscles that aren't being used for a while, so that's a downfall to this treatment. Also, the um, affected joints can be symptomatic shortly after the treatment, so it can be ineffective. So overall, it's found that orthotics are more effective than the immobilization. And in a study done in 2018, it was found that 53% of the treatment or the patients that were treated non-operatively with orthotics had pain relief, but those with treated with immobilization, only 25 to 33% had symptomatic improvement post-treatment. So not only are orthotics 20% more effective than immobilizations, but they also allow patients to remain more active and carry out like day-to-day -day activities. And then as far as surgical results, resection surgery is one of the type of treatments. And this is the one where abnormal connection between the bones is removed and it's replaced with a fatty tissue or muscle. Uh, after surgery, a hard cast might not be necessary, but the total recovery takes about six to 12 months. This type of surgery is the most common for tarsal coalitions because it provide or it preserves the natural foot motion and like range of motion. Um, but it only works well if the symptoms aren't that strong and the patient doesn't already have arthritis in the affected joints. And then the other type of surgery is arthrodesis, which is complete fusion of the affected joint. This is typically done on large and more severe coalitions because it um, kind of eliminates complete movement of the joint, so it's not the preferred surgery. The goal is to hold the bones in place and eliminate complete motion of the painful joints, and it's held together with like screws, pins, and screw and plate devices. And similar to resection surgery, the patient has to be in a cast, and it takes about six to 12 months for recovery. According to the data provided by Kaiser Permanent, it's found that both resection, resection surgery and arthrodesis are about 80% effective. Uh, both operations have similar risks post-treatment. And so though each surgery has about pretty similar outcomes, it's still recommended that resection surgery is chosen um, just so that, because it preserves the joint. So in conclusion, the results of the research conclude that surgery is the most um, beneficial route for treatment. Um, and it's the most effective in relieving patient symptoms. Since surgical treatment was 80% effective, where the most effective non-surgical treatment was only 53%. This supports my original hypothesis that surgical treatment is most effective in treating symptomatic tarsal coalitions. And it goes to no surprise because surgical treatment goes into foot and eliminates what's causing the problem. Whereas orthotics and non-surgical treatment kind of masks the problem, but doesn't eliminate the true cause of the pain. So as medical professionals decide which treatment is best, so keep this in mind, but in the end, no treatment option is best 100% of the time. So in the end, it just depends on the patient. Keep going. Hi, my name is Keely Anderson, and I did my research project on what people know about cloning. There was a study done that showed that 42% of people thought that cloning had already been applied to humans, which isn't true. So I figured I want to know what people know right now in the community. And I sent out a survey through Google Forms on the school email and through social media and got 65 responses 
and my hypothesis was that like people in a STEM major would know more about cloning and the processes behind it. But apparently that was wrong because I had about one third of people who wanted to be in STEM or currently are in STEM and the people that knew what like all the correct answers to my questions was on average about 16%, which is very, very low, showing that that was not a good measurement of like who would and wouldn't know. Hi, my name is Matt. Um, I am in ninth period POE, and this is my project. Uh, it is a model 426 Hemi 1964 uh, DOHC dual overhead cam. Uh, I used uh, syringes, cardboard, VEX pieces, and spray paint and um, it's to show um, how an engine works with the basic parts like your valves and cam and crank with your pistons so uh, let's see how it works I'm Eli and I've been running track for about five years and I've always wanted to know which events between distance and sprints was had like the greatest effect on heart rate. It turned out that hurdles actually had the greatest effect on heart rate and then sprints and then distance. The 3200 meter dash had the greatest change in heart rate at 132 beats per minute and then in the sprints it was the 200 meter dash at 118 beats per minute and in the uh, hurdles, it was the 300 meter hurdles at 107 beats per minute. My hypothesis was that the sprints would have the greatest change in heart rate because sprinters don't really breathe when they run. And then my hypothesis was somewhat accurate but not fully because the events under 400 meters did have the greatest change in heart rate as an average, but overall it wasn't as accurate. The ways this could have been improved was taking multiple kids per event and averaging their heart rates together because it could give a wider range of things, but the only real way to do this was to have the same kid run every event with an equal amount of rest time because that's it just tells you which way the certain muscle type fibers will work because every kid trains differently depending on what event they run. Hi, my name is Ireland, and my project was about teenagers' thoughts on COVID-19. I chose to research this because I wanted to know how kids felt about the pandemic uh, compared to what I know adults feel. Um, and I got my data by giving a survey out to all the high school students. I, did, I had 54 results when I did my survey, and I found that most students, they didn't think twice about the pandemic, they didn't really care about it, they didn't think it was going to be anything, but towards the end of the pandemic, what it is now, kids really just want it to be over and they want everything to be done with. And that is my project. Hi, I'm Kendall and I'm looking at the effects of early sports specialization versus diversification in young athletes. So an overall view of my paper is I'm looking into the world of sports and the rising popularity of young athletes specializing in a, a diverse um, thing of sports. So questions have been raised on the rate of injury seen by early sports specialization and I'm looking deeper into the effects of developing young athletes bodies from diversifying versus specializing. So the introduction on um, early sports specialization is known as participating year-round full-time with just a singular sport. And um, youth sports prove many benefits and can develop your psychological, social, and have amazing physical benefits on kids. But um, um, an increased prevalence is due to uh, coaching and parents in different perspectives on um, the
the outlooks of early sports specialization having negative effects on these kids. So the whole development is I was using a survey, so I used materials such as a Chromebook. I took LHS student athletes and I constructed a survey um, more opinion based. And I asked questions such as if they're a single or multi-sport athlete, at what age did they begin specializing? If you're a single sport athlete, do you play year round? The number of injuries seen as either a single or multi-sport athlete. And then I asked specifically like the type of injuries they pertain. So I got 74 responses total from all the LHS athletes. And 45 of them specialized in their sport and the other 29 diversified. And the mean collection of data said that about they specialize from four to 12 years of age. And it's seen that the rate of injury is much higher in those athletes um, who specialize in their sport. So in my graph, you have your single, single and multi-sport athletes. And then you can see that the blue is representing multi-sport and the red is the single sport athletes. And they pertain more number of injuries being a uh, single sport uh, specializing athlete. So the entire discussion is we are finding effects that early sport specialization can have on these young athletes and that it's best to delay specializing until about their mid-teens. Um, and delaying specialization in single sport athletes as long as possible supports general physical fitness, athletic athleticism and reduced injury rates in these athletes and young athletes should not play more than um, eight months per year and it's seen as essential it's not it's not seen as essential in building um, elite athletes uh, diversification is definitely the way to go and it's proving more benefits to um, increasing your overall cognitive development it improves your coordination, strength, motivation, and decreases your rate of injury. And it decreases burnout, stress, and overuse injuries, which are most prevalent. Um, divers diversifying is seen to lead to greater success in children and the adult lives. And to conclude all that, there's definitely a correlation between um, young athletes that specialize in a sport and an increased rate of injury. And though there's not major effects, it's still best to delay specializing and diversify. Hi, I'm Parker. I made an adjustable desk out of VEX parts. The motor is connected to a axle. The axle is connected to a gear, which moves a linear gear up and down. Using this button on the left, it goes up. And using the button on the right, it goes down. And you can also make it go up a certain amount. You can also go up, down a certain amount. This solves the problem of sitting at the desk too long. So when you are sitting at the desk and your back gets sore, you can just stand up and it'll be better for you. Hi, my name is Caleb Sampson. This is my research project, the effects of mental stress associated with video games on heart rate. My hypothesis was that as the level of difficulty increased from the first measured heart rate, their heart rate would increase as the amount of stress increases. I chose to research this because I thought it would be both simple enough and interesting enough to be worth my time researching. I got my data by having the participants play a game called Minesweeper. Now, Minesweeper is a game that consists of a square grid. In that grid, hidden are mines. Now these mines, if you click on them, result in losing the game. Inside the grid, you'll find squares with numbers inside of them. The numbers represent the sum total of mines that are in all adjacent squares next to that one. Once the position of a mine is deduced using those numbers, you can place a flag over it, which essentially clears that mine. The goal of the game is to clear it, clear the board. I increased the level of stress by the first level of difficulty, 
by just having the participants play the game normally as, slow as, the, as slowly as they want and taking their time. The second level of difficulty, I only gave them 30 seconds to do it. And the third level of difficulty, I only gave them 30 seconds to, 30 seconds to do it, and we had people giving them encouragement to tell them to go faster. Uh, what I ended up finding was that from the first measured heart rate, on average, the heart rates did increase as the level of stress increased. There were three outliers of the nine participants that I had. Uh, two of them actually had their heart rates decrease as the level of stress increased. That would probably require some further research as to why that happened. And then one of them had a decrease in heart rate uh, from the first to the second level of difficulty and then a massive spike to the third level of difficulty. My name is Vanessa Wright and I did my project on the increasing pediatric mental health cases. Uh, so recently, more over the last five years, there's been an increase in pediatric mental health cases, specifically in depression and anxiety. And so what a lot of people don't think about is when they see a child like throwing a fit in the store, like crying, yelling at their mom, or just like flop down on the floor, they all think that it's just because the child is out of control or that the parent is not uh, properly parenting. However, it has been found that part of those are symptoms of pediatric mental health cases and the child could be having like a panic attack on the floor. Uh, for my project, I completed a survey and I sent it to the Lancaster City Schools uh, staff as they are all in contact with pediatric age range children. And I also sent it to multiple local um, like counseling. So my mentor was Jody from Spirit of Peace Counseling and she sent it to her team and then it was sent to another organization in town. And part of the questions just asked like, are you a part of a organization that deals with pediatric age range children? And it also asked questions like, have you seen an increase in pediatric mental health cases? and the overall um, average said yes they have. And then I asked them specific questions like um, what are, out of all of your diagnosis, how many of them have, um, like what, what are the most prevalent? Um, and most of them said that it was anxiety and depression. Um, others noticed like behavioral disorders such as ADHD and from that, I asked um, what were the causes of that increase in pediatric age range, and most of them said that it was from family issues, whether it was depression, um, divorce, or if it was just like depressed parents, or if it was like there was just um, arguing in the household, or if it was anything from like just the child is not being treated properly by the family. And then the other incre uh, increased cause was uh, societal and um, like just other pressures in their environments, which could be anything from like social media to just like other people that they hang out with. And then my final question, it wasn't really my final question, but it was the like main focus question, was what can the community do to stop this increase? And most of them said that there needs to be a raised awareness for the pediatric mental health because it's not something that many people think about, therefore not too much is being done on it. And also just like providing proper resources, not only for those who are suffering, but for the families so that we can get that cause uh, decreased. So not only is there an increase in anxiety and depression, but just mental health or disorders in general and the number of pediatric children who are committing suicide or are just going into these very dark states is increasing and it's something that definitely needs to be taken care of because when what they have found is that when one person is experiencing it and they start talking about it and they're like bringing a, not really awareness but they're bringing um, light to the situation, like there's jokes being made. Other students or the people around them are also beginning to experience it because they're focusing on it. And it's not something that you necessarily want going around. Um, so in conclusion, 
the factors that are increasing pediatric mental health cases are um, family issues and societal pressures. And there's other things as well, such as like trauma or drugs. And then what needs to be done about that is there needs to be a raised awareness. So we need to make it understood that pediatric mental health is a serious issue that is occurring and there's children losing their lives from it. And also we need to give resources to those who are struggling and to those families to try to lower that number and to get the kid, these kids the help that they need. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. All right, hi, my name is Lydia Sarah, and for my research project, I compared the responses between males and females when I told them that I love them. My hypothesis was that females would respond in a more positively way, like saying things such as, I love you too, or like thank you, like in a happy way, and then that males would respond in a more negative way with like um, responses like okay or, um, or just be like confused or something. I chose to do this research project just because I thought it would be fun and I thought it would be different than a lot of the other projects and I thought it might be like one that I would enjoy doing along the way. I got my data just by going up to people around the high school mostly. I went to a few people outside, but it was mostly just around the high school, and it was almost all teenagers, but with a few adults that are in the mix, and I just told each person that I loved them and recorded their responses and then put them together in a chart. By the end of the project, I discovered that my hypothesis was right, that females typically responded in a more positive or maybe a more neutral way, like saying thank you or I love you too, and that males responded more negatively to my statement. My name's Haley and my project is a bookshelf with a special feature and the special feature is that it has buttons on it and the buttons color coordinate with the books on the shelf so if someone were to pick a book they would press the button that corresponds with their book and when they press it a piece of paper will flip up that tells them information about the book so if someone were to pick this book they would press the brown button because the brown is on the side of it and so when you press that, this uses a servo motor to flip up. And then they can see like the rating, the recommended age, and whether or not there's a movie for it. And then if you press it again, it goes back down. So this is just to make it easier for people to pick books. Yeah. Uh, my name is Emma Wana, and I studied the connection between extracurricular activities and school performance. I hypothesized that students in more extracurricular activities would have less time to do schoolwork, but not necessarily less ambition. And I chose to do this because I just, I know a lot of people in a lot of extracurricular activities who struggle with time, so I was curious as to how much it actually affects their grades. I got my data by sending out a survey that asked questions like, what's your ACT score? What's your GPA? Um, how willing are you to do schoolwork? And I found um, by looking at this data that students involved in more extracurricular activities had higher ACT scores, higher GPAs, and were more willing to do work than students that were less involved. Hi, my name is Keaton, and I studied the correlation between aerobic and anaerobic exercise effects on heart rate. So, for my abstract, um, I went down to Fulton Field, which is a track at Lancaster High School, and I got six female and six male participants, and uh, they obviously volunteered when I asked. They didn't force them. And uh, so, basically, I asked them to do or participate in two tests. Uh, one of those being an aerobic exercise and the other being an anaerobic exercise. And for the aerobic exercise, I had them run a mile or 1,600 meters. And for the anaerobic exercise, I had them do three sets of 10 bench press. So that was however much weight they could do for 10, 10 reps. So did you know that heart rate could vary based on certain activities that you do? Yeah. Well, uh, based on aerobic exercise, which is something that requires, your, your muscles require oxygen to do this certain or such activity, um, basically when you are doing the activity, you need to be breathing and it's over a longer period of time rather than a short period of time. So it's more of a stretched exercise. And then for your anaerobic exercise, this is an exercise that does not require oxygen and that you can do sh for shorter periods of time, but more intense exercise. So moving on to my methods and materials. So my method was 
obviously, like I said before, walking down Fulton Field and asking those 12 participants, half females, half males, if they would like to partici participate in my experiment. And uh, so first off, I started doing the aerobic part of the experiment. So I had the uh, six female track runners. I had them run a mile or 1,600 meters, like I said. And a lot of them had their own watches, and those who didn't were able to borrow mine, which is an Apple Watch Series 3, which has a heart rate tracking monitor on it. And then I believe what the others, other few used was a Garmin, and it also has the same exact thing that the Apple Watch has. And obviously that being said, there's a lot of room for error, because who knows how accurate these heart rate monitors are in these watches, so just want to throw that out there. And then also, um, I had the six males also do the same thing. And you can see the, the results here. Um, these first, this it's hard to read because of how it's placed, but this first one, these blue are the male, and then the red's the female. So this first one's your uh, aerobic exercise, and then this is also the aerobic. And then, um, so what I did was after I had them run a mile, I took the exact same participants, female and male, and we went to the weight room where off Fulton Field, and uh, we used the bench, barbell, weights, and however, met, however much weight they could do for uh, three sets of 10, that's what we put on, and then we had them go ahead and uh, do so-called bench press. And uh, then we got our results here. Here's your anaerobic, and anaerobic for female. And based on the results, there's a slight correlation between a higher heart rate or like higher average um, heart rate with anaerobic exercise than it were for aerobic. Because when you're doing or running a mile, uh, you get about, I'd say 400 meters in and then you're hitting your max, your peak heart rate, and then you're gonna go into what's called a threshold. Once you hit that threshold, your heart rate then slows down because you're getting comfortable with running. And then that's why it's lower than anaerobic. And it's also using oxygen to where anaerobic is not. And for anaerobic, the reason why it's so high, obviously, like I said, not using oxygen, but it's much more intense for a shorter period of time. So, I actually lied. The, uh, the average was higher for anaerobic, or aerobic, than anaerobic, because anaerobic was shorter. So they had a higher max, but their average was lower because it was for a shorter period of time compared to aerobic. And, uh, however, there was one outlier with a female one in my results. Uh, her max heart rate for aerobic exercise was five beats a minute faster than anaerobic. So I'd just like to throw out that, yeah, there was room for air because who knows how accurate the watches were. And for my conclusion, um, basically, I'd just like to thank all the people who participated in my experiment and that, um, how there was a slight correlation between one of the two. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, Mr. Barrett. My name is Shirky Burnside, and my project was based around the question, does homework affect students' mental and physical health? I hypothesized that everything would be impacted, including food habits, sleeping patterns, family time, physical activity, and stress levels. I chose to research this just because I was curious about the correlation between the two. I got my data by sending out a survey to 53 students at the Lancaster High School, and I found that homework had little to no impact on family time and food habits, but impacted everything else. Therefore, concluding that homework affects physical health more, or affects mental health more than physical health. So my name is Brody. Uh, this is my project. It's a garage door opener. Um, so what I did is I made this garage door here. I connected a skewer to it. And this skewer is connected to some strings that's pulled by this sprocket and then pulled by this motor. And I'll show you how it works. Okay, so I programmed my project to when I press this button once, it'll spin this sprocket and the garage door will go up. And when I press it again, it'll spin the other direction and the garage door will go down. My name is Jacob Rohr, and I did the average heart rate increased in different skill groups on a football team. My hypothesis was that the heart rate would go from skill to big skill to linemen. The different skill groups 
were skill, which was wide receivers and DBs. Big skill was linebackers and fullbacks, and then linemen were the heaviest people on the team. Uh, what I found is that my hypothesis was right, but I didn't know by how much. From skill to big skill was 3.2 and an increase of beats per minute. And then from big skill to linemen was 8.8 .8 beats per minute of an increase. And then... Haley Anderson and I did my research over how sleep affects the academic performance in high school students. The goal of this experiment was to find any correlation between sleep and the academic performance in high school students. Um, this experiment was survey based and the survey questions asked about the students GPA, quality of sleep, um, if they think that their sleep affects their quality of their grades, um, what letter grades they make, and how many hours of sleep they get per night. Um, the result of the experiment supported the hypothesis. The hypothesis was that students who do not get the recommended hours of sleep per night do not do as well as those who do academically. Um, there is some correlation between sleeping and your grades but it's not a hundred percent supported because there are some students who do sleep poorly but still do well um, academically. Um, the materials that I used for this research was my Chromebook to conduct the survey and send it out to the students, um, my mentor, and then I used a calculator to analyze some of the data and I used Google Forms and student emails to send out the survey. Um, I first created the survey and then I sent it out to the student body and collected as many responses as I could so I could have the best um, results and data. Um, half of the students sleep well or they sleep very poorly. 92% of the students only sleep five to seven hours which they should be sleeping eight to ten hours. 48.7% of the students are earning A and B grades, um, but they're only sleeping five to seven hours, so their grades could be improved with sleeping more. Um, the students who are earning a 3.5 GPA and four and above are sleeping seven to eight plus hours. But on the certain question down here, I ask how, or do you think that sleep affects your grades? And only 31% of the students said yes to that question, but then they also, more students agreed to the question after that, which was, do you think you would do better on a test if you slept well the night before? So that 9% difference um, just shows that some people think that sleep doesn't affect their academic performance, but they agreed to the question that was basically saying that it does. But overall, overall, um, all of the results and research gathered did support the hypothesis. All right, this is my automated hydraulic bridge, and when it works, you run the motors, pushing the linear gear, therefore pushing the syringe into the wall, running into this syringe, which pushes the bridge up. All right, this is based off of a manual hydraulic bridge that we did earlier in the year, where we used the same sort of design without all the robotics and the coding involved. I'm Madison Thames. I did my research project on the effects of age and gender on cognitive flexibility. I chose this topic because I'm interested in psychology and executive function and dysfunction. Uh, my, hypothesis was, my hypothesis was that age and gender would both have significant effects on cognitive flexibility. Um, cognitive flexibility is the executive function that is responsible for the ability to make important behavioral adaptations in response to changes in the environment. Um, 
by testing my hypothesis by sending a survey out to 32 different people of different ages and gender and by giving them a street color and word test. Um, the results showed that age does have a significant effect on cognitive flexibility with uh, much longer reaction times in the adult age groups and that gender uh, does not have a significant correlation to cognitive flexibility with minimal differences in the reaction times in males and females. Hi, my name is Eric Johnson and my project was on how eating balanced diets of full of the daily recommended amount of nutrients affects the immune system. So I'm going to start with my abstract. Uh, the purpose of this report was to find the relationship between uh, balanced diets of nutrients and the immune system and what effect the nutrients had on the immune system. So this experiment was conducted by doing extensive research over uh, two articles that I found that had already done the research. So I didn't do an actual experiment myself. And the two articles were called The Effect of the Nutri Nutritional Elements on the Immune System and Nutrition in the Immune System, a Complicated Tango. So the results of the hypothesis and the experiments matched. So the nutrients actually do have a positive effect on the immune system and they strengthen different nutrients strengthen different parts of the immune system. So the methods that I did and the materials that I used were a Chromebook, uh, Google Chrome for research and to find the articles, and I used Google Docs to organize all of my research. So the methods was I found my articles on Google Chrome, and then I reviewed uh, and analyzed the data that they found and organized it into charts, which you can see in the results and discussion sections of my poster. And then I drew conclusions from their data to match my hypothesis. So my results, um, the first article is Nutrition and Immune System, a Complicated Tango, right here. And so this was done by uh, doing case studies of different nutrients and uh, what their individual effect was on the immune system. So for example, uh, this chart here, uh, they didn't do as many as the second article that I found, but the effects were still the same. So omega-3 fatty acids, uh, they suppress the uh, allergic reaction and like inflammation in the immune system. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids enhance tight junctions in cells. Vitamins uh, affected the T regulator regulatory cell function as well as ligand and act as ligands, which is pretty much a bonding element. And amino acids, which uh, affect the and strengthen the cell wall structures of the cells. Um, they went more in depth with omega-3 fatty acids and omega-6 fatty acids. And so pretty much these fatty acids act as substrates and uh, initiate the immune response in the cells. And you can read more about that in this section. And then the second article, which was the effect of nutritional elements on the immune system, is in this box. And they did a lot more case studies on different nutrients. So they did more of like car uh, carbohydrates, more specific vitamins and minerals, which you can read about there. And they found the same conclusion, which was that the nutrients do strengthen the immune system. And so to wrap it up, in conclusion, the hy my hypothesis was correct in that the immune system is strengthened by having a variety of these nutrients in your diet. Hi, I'm Liberty. Um, I did my research project on sports that cause the most mild to severe injuries among male and female athletes. Um, so I sent out a survey to about 150 people, um, and I asked them questions like, have you ever uh, had a severe injury, and what sports do you play? Um, I found that over 50% of people who play sports um, have been mildly to severely injured. Um, in males, the sport that had the most injuries was football and soccer, and in girls, it was cross country and track. And that lined up with my hypothesis because I thought that 
sports that had the longest training seasons and sports that were the most high impact would have the most injuries. Hi, I'm Evelyn. This is my automated greenhouse. So this is like a prototype for a big greenhouse with a self-watering system. I have the reservoir and then I have a tube that goes to the plant and it kinks and unkinks on a timer. So when I press this button, it's going to start watering the plant and then it turns off. And it's on a timer system, so there's going to be about 30 seconds until it waters it next. I have this container down here to catch the water at the bottom because when a plant is really dry, the water will go straight to the bottom and won't, and it needs to be able to suck it up from the bottom too. So you can change this timer to make it for a full day so that it'll be on like every hour, every two hours, as long as you need. So right now it's on a 30 second timer. So in 10 seconds, it will water it again. Hi, my name is Lucas and I did this research project to uh, find out how many people uh, forget their medicine. And this project is personally me because I've taken medicine with the accident. I've taken it twice before. So I did a research uh, survey at Lancaster High School and I found out that out of the uh, 40 people that I took that 55% of them who do take medicine have actually taken their medicine more than once and 75% uh, of them actually admitted to taking it twice by accident. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for coming to STEM Tank. Uh, this is the LADS building, an architectural consultants group. Uh, and our, for our group project, we decided uh, to build the Lancaster Formal Ballroom uh, as a proposal for a new building site. Uh, you know, we went through a very particular process in determining what we should build. I just want to give you a walk through of this so that you can kind of see our thinking and uh, hopefully you get a good understanding of what our idea is. Um, so our first step in the process is brainstorming. Uh, we brainstormed ideas as to what Lancaster needs. What does Lancaster need? And we realize that a ballroom is something that we don't have here in town. The closest thing we have is the fairgrounds. And we decided it'd be really nice if we could have a ballroom uh, to have conventions, uh, proms, even just nice dinners at, um, so that we can attract some tourism dollars to the city and ultimately grow the local economy. Um, and we decided that would be best. Um, we had a couple of other options, but this one, uh, I would say by far, uh, we all agreed this, this would really be great. So our first step in the design process uh, was just kind of constructing um, a drawing of uh, our proposal, but also before that, we need to figure out where we're gonna put this. Um, Alrighty, Chase, would you like to talk about the uh, topographical features and the site that we decided to use for our project? Yes, Thomas. Um, our site is located at 1301 80 Point Drive and across from the Sonic, and it, it's very nice because it's a very flat, ideal site, and it just decreases complications that we might have with the flat ground. It's most, idea for, most ideal for our big area that we have for the venue, because it's a very big uh, venue. Um, very ideal, very yeah. nice. Not yeah, I mean, it's, about that. I mean, really, I think the best site in town, and you know, you guys did a good job of figuring that out. Um, and then after that, we said, oh, we need to actually get a drawing, uh, find some good dimensions, figure out how big we want to make this uh, Lancaster formal ballroom. And Eli, you kind of headed that up, didn't you? I, I did. We so we started out. You know, we said, okay, how many people do we want to have in this ballroom? How many, you know, what's our occupancy need to look like? You know, um, what's our size going to need to look like? So based on that, uh, you know, I came up with a few dimensions, got those on a on, on a paper and. We made a nice scale drawing, um, all the features we want, you know, we need a kitchen, we need office space, we need, obviously, we need, we need the ballroom, we need, a, and we need an entry area. So we had to take all those things into account and uh, get them down, mark everything down so we can uh, put them into a 3D model. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that was a very important part and uh, we did a sketch for that. Um, and while we were doing that, uh, we had to conform to a certain, um, certain code. And uh, Chase, you were kind of in charge of that, making sure we're on the right code. What was it like, you think, to have to follow the code? And what were a couple code things that we had to take a look at? Oh, um, it's, it was pretty tedious because, you know, the kitchen, you like only 200 uh, square foot per person. Oh my so you goodness. Only have, so, only have so many people in there. And, uh, you know, you just have to make sure that you have everything to code, enough exits for all the people and egress. Um, other than that, I mean, it was 
It was all right. <laughs> no, yeah. no major issues or complications well, that's good. we ran into. I tell you, that's good to hear, Chase. Yeah, I'm glad we got that going and good job figuring that out. Um, so we have the building. We have the kind of the 3D model of what we want it to look like. We're making sure we're following the law. All we need to do now is kind of develop that site and make it look really nice for it. And Christian, you were kind of heading that up. What, uh, what site changes did we make? Yeah, so uh, obviously uh, the biggest uh, kind of conflict we had was so we have the building, but where are people going to park? So uh, on our site, we had to um, account for parking and also like the flow of traffic um, in the area. Uh, additionally, with that, we had to um, kind of make an area where we want to have like, a, like a, a pond with like a fountain in the front of the building, as well as uh, some planting some trees because the site's pretty bare right now and uh, not very pretty or appealing. So uh, we're planning on planting some trees uh, or on the file, putting some trees in and uh, just doing some landscaping there. So yeah. Yeah, I tell you, I think we're gonna, that site, uh, should this project have been developed, uh, would look really nice. Um, and as with the ballroom itself, um, I think we did an excellent job. I'm very happy with how this project um, went. And um, yeah, this is the Lancaster Ballroom. Uh, if you have any questions about this project, feel free to reach out to me, Thomas Richardson, uh, and the uh, Lads Building uh, and Architectural Consultants. Thank you. Hi, I'm Riley. And my project was about how background noise affects human concentration. Um, so I took some students and I gave them some fourth grade double digit multiplication problems and I took their time and accuracy. And I played classical music through headphones and then I played hard rock music through headphones for the second set of math problems. And I found, or in my hypothesis was that I thought that the classical music would take more time but would be more accurate than the hard rock music which I thought would take less time but would be less accurate and I found that really that hypothesis was wrong because it ended up being that the hard rock was actually more accurate but, but I did find that it took less time. Hi my name is Alzen Cutter Henrik and the purpose of my experiment was to predict and determine the reaction of the high school um, when the government takes COVID precautions away. Um, I did this through creating a survey, which I asked um, how people currently wear their masks if they do it as they are instructed by the government, and um, how people will stop wearing their masks and if the vaccines will affect this. I predicted that the majority of people will not wear their masks anymore just because everyone's so burnt out on, on everything and they just want to get back to their normal lives. Um, so after analyzing the data from my survey, 61.8% said they would wear their masks or they wouldn't wear their masks if they did get the vaccine and 571 said they would also stop wearing their masks even if they did not have the vaccine. And this was out of the 82.9% who actually do wear their masks correctly. Um, this information is important to inform people about the vaccine because um, if you have not gotten it, it's important to still wear your mask because people are out there and they're high risk for, um, for COVID and in order for us to reach uh, herd immunity, 50 to 80% of the population in America needs to get their vaccine. My name is Casey, and this is my vehicle that I built. I call it the RUT, the Rough and Uneven Terrain Transport, and it's meant to get around all sorts of obstacles in front of it. That way it can get to its desired location. I built it using Vex parts and coating it. I coated it so whenever it detected anything with these two ultrasonic sensors in front of it within 10 inches or so, it would make a sharp left, not sharp right turn, keep going, avoid the object, and continue straight where it was meant to go. Here's my project in action. And when it detects something in front of it, it turns. project on how being upside down affects cognitive ability, specifically in gymnasts. My hypothesis was that being upside down will create a slower response time and lessen cognitive ability. Yeah, we're starting. Mm -hmm. so bad. You're doing great. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, I'm Mel Hammer, and I did my research project on how being upside down affects cognitive ability specifically in gymnasts. My hypothesis was that being upside down will create a slower response time and reaction 
I read three tests for each individual where they were standing upright, holding a handstand against the wall, and walking in a handstand. They were timed, and time per question for the walking portion was the longest, proving my hypothesis correct. Hi, I'm Riley. I did my project on how mental health is affected in club sports versus school sports. Um, I asked questions like, do you enjoy club or school ball more? And um, my hypothesis was that people would like club better. And I was right. 57.3% um, of people like club sports better than school. Hi, my name is Caleb Sampson. Uh, this is my final engineering project. It's an airplane and it's made out of balsa wood, wood glue, popsicle sticks, a dowel rod, and some hot glue, and a little bit of paper to act as the foil. Um, what inspired me to make this project, oh, it's a little windy, was that I want to be uh, an engineer when I grow up. I would specifically like to go into aerospace engineering. So I uh, did a little bit of setting up on uh, aircrafts, how, uh, how wings work, and different types of wings. And I decided to go with just a plain straight-winged aircraft and a really long and wide wing to get the maximum amount of lift because it doesn't it can't go very fast. Hi, I'm Aiden Nagan. I did my research on the effect of stool seats on students' back pain. Um, in my research, I compared the stool seats versus the chairs and desks that we regularly sit in. Um, I found in my survey results that stool seats cause um, back pain in 83% of students and in chairs only 43% of students um, feel the back pain. And then if I asked if you had a choice, would you rather sit in chairs or stool seats? And 100% of students said they would sit in chairs. Um, so, in, in my conclusion, I feel like, in conclusion, I think moving forward into the new building that um, we should incorporate more chairs and seats and try to move away from the school seats, especially in science classes like we have in Mr. Wells and chemistry classes, and I think that'll be better for students moving forward. Okay. Hi, my name is Holden, and my research project was on the oxygen saturation levels in male track athletes running different events. The reason I chose this was because the human body system has three different energy systems. The first two does not require oxygen, and is used in like primarily shorter distance races. And then the third one does require oxygen, is used in longer distance races. My hypothesis was that the two shorter distance races would have a higher oxygen saturation than the longer distance because they don't require the oxygen. My results didn't really reflect that and didn't show much correlation between the percentage and the different events. Hi, I'm William and this is my project, the dumb waiter. It's meant to transport something from here back up to here. So this is a compartment and it's a tissue box as you can see. When you hit this button, it goes up there. And once it's up here, once you hit the button up here, it goes back down. I'll be transporting this water bottle here to demonstrate it. And then you get take it out if you wanted to. And then once you wanted to send it back down, there you go. That's my project. Hi, my name is Nicholas Grayson. I did my project on how does the amount of screen time someone endures daily affect their mental health. So basically, just like how much screen time affects someone's mental health. So the goal of my experiment was to find out how like the amount of time someone were to spend like in front of their screen per day affects them mentally whether that's like their motivation or their confidence their pursuit of happiness something like that so i did my project based on like a survey it is survey based experiment and uh i did mental health based questions 
stuff to just do like with how you're feeling emotionally or mentally. And the objective that I was trying to come across was obviously mental health because like it's a very big thing at our time. It's something like I've always like growing up having like poor mental health and like just trying to embrace that and get out of that. So it's just something I wanted to do. So the hypothesis I had was that um, basically if people were to spend more than like seven plus hours, because that's what I got from my results, seven plus hours seem to have more poor mental health compared to people that would have like five to six or lower. Uh, basically like the questions that were answered that I had on there were like, um, how are your grades based on how much screen time you have or like how is your confidence based on like what you see on social media, stuff like that. So I have a, like some pie charts here. It's kind of hard to read, but I have about more than 60% like our people are like are on their device for seven hours or more per day. And then only like, there's like 70% of people that are like seven plus hours rather than like doing schoolwork or like using their phone or like a device for work. And uh, <coughs> down here, just have more pie charts of like mental health based questions. And uh, in my results, uh, I came to the conclusion that uh, my hypothesis was proven correct that if you were to spend more than seven plus hours, those questions I put on there, people answered more negatively about their mental health than people that had less than seven hours. There were a few stragglers like here and there that like had like answered questions that were the opposite of the other one, but basically in my conclusion, I just came to the fact that people mainly have poor mental health based on their screen time if it's plus seven or more hours. Hi, I'm Alex. I did my project on if day trading affected blood pressure, um, which because I did this because I found very little about it when I looked on uh, websites to find actual studies about this and also could have been the news a lot lately and I thought it would be relatively quick to test. And the way I went about it was 15 people between ages of 12 to 43 were, uh, had their blood pressure taken at, at one point they were instructed on how to use an app um, to do uh, uh, what's called a paper money account, which is fake money, uh, and then they were given $25,000 of this fake money to day trade with. After 30 minutes, they had the blood pressure taken again to mark any change at all. They also had if they profited or made losses uh, marked as well. Uh, and what I found was that a deep, almost all of them had an increase in both uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, systolic blood pressure actually went up more significantly so, interestingly, than the diastolic blood pressure did. And also I found that everyone who, um, everyone who profited, all but one of them, had a depression in either the diastolic or systolic uh, blood pressure, which to say went down. So in conclusion, I did find a linkage between day trading and uh, positive blood pressure or increase in blood pressure. Hi, my name is Sophia, and for my research project, I did the generational effects of COVID on Gen Z versus Gen X. For my research, I conducted a survey that I sent out to friends and family with baseline questions about their physical and mental health during the past year. As a result, both generations um, were negatively affected in their work, school life, and stress. The graphs down here demonstrate that both generations have um, had higher stress and have been harder to focus during work and school due to COVID. Um, and then I also conducted a survey about the relationships that both generations face, the had during um, COVID and towards the end of COVID. And Gen X had a higher rate of either loss in relationships or um, distancing than Gen Z. But both generations overall had, um, COVID had not impacted them. Hi, I'm Mia, and for my project, I study how different racing suits affect speed and swimming. So basically, I conducted um, this study to see just exactly how much um, slower you are from a tech suit to a practice suit. And to do this, I asked 15 competitive swimmers um, to send me their times for 50 freestyle with a tech suit and without a tech suit. And for my results, I concluded that on average, a person's increase from a tech suit to a non-tech suit was 2.95%. And specifically for males and females, I found that males had a um, lesser increase for 
2.81% and females had 3.04%. And I also had distance and sprint swimmers and I found that distance had a 2.76% and sprinters had a 3.11%. So basically in my study found that um, males and distance swimmers were to have a lesser increase and Texas would lesser like had a less of an impact than um, females and sprinters respectively. Hi, I'm Josie Jewell and my topic is the correlations between healing crystals um, using the placebo effect to show increased mental health rates. And basically the abstract um, of this presentation is that healing crystals there's not much known about them, so I did a couple. Sur I did one survey and I used another survey, a professional survey, and I compared the results of those surveys to see whether people believed that crystals could actually heal you, like scientifically, or if it was all in people's heads, and it was all in people's heads, basically. Uh, the objective. So. Not a lot of people believe in crystals and there's kind of a stigma around them and um, I do think that as an alternative medicine it should be just, um, explored further and that crystals are something that people should look into um, as like a complementary medicine, not something that you should use just by itself, like pharmaceuticals, but it should be used like together for that maximum benefits. And since there's not much known about them, um, that research would be beneficial. And really good. Okay. I am wearing right now green adventuring and green adventuring helps with emotional support, and I'm wearing amethyst, which relieves stress, and I'm wearing tiger's eye, which is also just for luck. And do I actually think that these, like, work? Like, it's kind of all in my head. So I wear them, and I think about wearing them, and it kind of just helps me mentally. It doesn't actually do anything, like, scientifically. Um, so my methods, I get, out a survey to Lancaster High School students and um, it just asked a couple questions about like placebo effect, do you know what that is, do you struggle with your mental health, do you own any crystals and I got a lot of results and 70.8% of people believe that crystals do have a placebo effect and affect them, um, like crystals will help them mentally. And the professional survey that I compared that data to was done in Pakistan. And um, these researchers sent out a survey to like a clinic and um, their survey stated that people believed that healing gemstones could help heal, but that they didn't believe much in them. And they thought it was very superstitious. So, in conclusion, um, healing crystals do have a placebo effect, as shown by the Lancaster High School students and the and the professional survey um, kind of contradicts that because those people didn't believe as much in it and thought it was really superstitious. Hi, my name is Peyton, and for my engineering project, I did two separate games. My first game is a hydraulic claw. For this game, you need two people because there are four syringes, two syringes for each person, and there will be two balls on the platform. You have a minute to lift each ball and put them into the cup. Each of these syringes are a different color, so that way you can tell what part you're moving. The parts are swiveling the body, moving the body up and down, raising the claw, and opening the claw. Here are how two of them work. 
My second game was a coded basketball hoop. For this game, it's one person game and you have 20 seconds to make 10 basketballs. The code starts when you hit this button and it goes back and forth for 20 seconds, then stops and resets once you hit the button again. I'm Madison Sims. I'm here with my research project on the effects of age and gender on cognitive flexibility. I chose this topic because I'm interested in psychology and executive function and dysfunction. Uh, my, hypothesis was, my hypothesis was that age and gender would both have significant effects on cognitive flexibility. Um, cognitive flexibility is the executive function that is responsible for the ability to make in response to changes in the environment. Um, I tested my hypothesis by sending a survey out to 32 different people of different ages and gender and by giving them a straightforward and word test. Um, the results showed that age does have a significant effect on problem flexibility with uh, much longer reaction times in the adult age groups and that gender uh, does not have a significant correlation to cognitive flexibility with minimal differences in reaction times in males and females. My name is Grant. Uh, for my final project, I built a clock. So, what happens is the gears in here, here's like a paper showing what happens. The mechanical advantage adds up to 60, and there's a motor here that spins it, and it's like a pendulum. So, every second, it, spin, it spins at one tick, so this hand down here, it will move. Um, then there's also another gear train leading up to 60 minutes total, and it's supposed to be an hour. So, yeah. And that concludes the 2021 Virtual STEM Expo here at Lancaster High School. We appreciate you watching this evening. And we hope that you've really enjoyed hearing from our students as they describe their research and their projects. It's been a difficult year here for us, but I think you can see that our students have excelled throughout this year and the future is very bright. I hope you all have a wonderful summer and we look forward to starting a new school year in a few short months.